الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. May Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The topic this evening: Did God become man? Is of great importance to all human beings because, in my view, it is a central concept which distinguishes between the true religion of God and false religion, the true worship of God and false worship. Now, the vast majority of human beings have always believed in God. From the most ancient of civilizations to the most primitive of modern societies, religion with God as its center has always formed the foundation for human culture. The denial of God's existence is something which has always been limited to a few individuals and it really wasn't until the 20th century that we found large numbers of people embracing the idea of the non-existence of God, promoted mainly through the communist ideologies of Marx, Lenin, Engels, Mao Zedong, etc. The reality, even in those circumstances, is that though the society as a whole, in Russia, in China, Albania, Yugoslavia, although these societies paid lip service to communist ideology, the vast majority of the people still continue to believe in God. And researchers, some Western researchers, a number of years back, proposed the idea that belief in God was in fact genetic or something a part of human nature. <clears throat> Many others rejected this idea, Many of the anthropologists, sociologists rejected this idea because they had already accepted the Freudian explanations for human belief in God. They had already accepted Darwinian explanations for human existence, which really didn't leave room for God. However, modern thought, modern research, a couple of years ago, scientists uh, doing research on uh, people who had problems in their brains, people who had epilepsy, uh, schizophrenia, these kinds of, of uh, mental problems which, which they assume had to do with mal malfunctions in the brain. In doing experiments with such people, which involved boring holes in their skulls and sticking probes into their brain, you know, probing different parts of the human brain to find out what would happen if we touch this part or what would happen if we touch that part, that perhaps they may touch a part that would rectify uh, the problems that these people were facing. And they found, in the course of their experiments, that there was a particular part in the brain that every time they probed it, the person who was being treated would experience these massive religious experiences. A, an awareness of, a sense of God, the presence of God, this kind of thing, he would come out of these treatments with these feelings. As a result of that, there was 
they did an article in the Scientific American and it was published in uh, international newspapers that the scientists had found what they believed to be the God spot in the brain. They concluded that the human brain was, as they put it, hotwired for belief in God. This confirms that belief in God, at least for, for the scientists, etc., is something so basic in human existence that one needs to address the truth, the correctness of that belief. Especially when we consider that though the majority of people on earth do have a belief in God, when one goes from one society to another society, one finds a variety of different understandings of God. And as a result, we have a variety of different religions promoting these different understandings. However, in spite of the variety which is there, the concept of God, the concept of there being one supreme being over all, including the half gods or gods who represented some of the attributes of God, seems to indicate that belief in the one God was primary and that in time that belief degenerated and became either a belief in intermediaries between God and man or that some aspects of God's creation is giving the attributes of God so God may be worshipped partially in the spirits of nature. At any rate, accepting that the belief in one God is fundamental, there does remain an aspect of that belief which defies human logic and reason, but yet has become the cornerstone of the faith of the vast majority of people. It is the belief that God became a man. It is a belief which is shared by both Hinduism and Christianity and the offshoots of Hinduism which deserves to be question deserves to be reflected upon because what we find is that in Islam the concept of God leaves no room for the idea that God could become a man that he became a man any time in the past that he would ever become a man any time in the present or the future that is eliminated from the concept of the one God. And this is a particular <coughs> distinguishing feature which separates Islam in one category into one category and lumps all of the other religions into another category. Those that believe that God became God. Now, when we look at this belief in Hinduism we see that there is a philosophy <coughs> behind it that philosophy holds that there is ultimately no distinction between God and his creation every living being according to Hindu philosophy, has a self or a soul, which they refer to as Atman. 
And they believe that that self or soul is at the same time Brahman or the universal one who at the same time pervades everything, every piece and particle of creation, Brahman is present within you. This belief de developed into a social order for Hindus wherein they believe that Brahman created himself in a form which they refer to as Purusa, who is in the form of a human being with a thousand heads and a thousand eyes. And this being, Purusa, is sacrificed to Brahman and he's cut up into pieces. And from his mouth, the head area, came the Brahmin class, the upper segment of the society. And from the uh, arms came the Satrias, Satrias, the noblemen. From the thighs came the Vaishyas, and from the feet came the Shudras. This is the concept of how society then was organized, coming from the belief that God created himself as a man and then sacrificed himself to himself. And from that, human beings were later created. And they had to that a further belief that God became man in a, in a variety of different incarnations, generally held to be ten, in which he appeared as a fish, then he appeared as a tortoise, as a boar, that is a wild pig, as a man lion, as a dwarf, and then he appeared as Rama, who is everybody sort of knows about Rama, and Krishna, and Buddha. And it is held that he will appear in the future as Kalkin, or what is referred to as the Kalki avatar. Now, this belief is connected with a further belief of Hindus that since the soul is itself God, that human beings when they die, they are on a path back to God to reunite with Brahma, the world soul. When a person dies, he comes back, he's reborn and he dies again, and he's reborn and he dies again. In the process of being reborn and dying, if he started from the Shudras, then he, and he's good, then he works his way up until he eventually reaches to the Brahmin level, where after dying, he goes through the process known as Moksha or Nirvana amongst the Buddhists, in which he now reunites back with Brahma. And this idea that human beings really, what they need to know, what is most important for them in this life, is to realize that they are in fact God. Now, this is related to some degree to the high rate of suicide amongst Hindus. 
People sometimes wonder, why do Hindus kill themselves so readily? You read so many articles in the newspapers, uh, especially in India, or where there are large Hindu communities, that whenever people have a problem, you know, so many people are hanging themselves, killing themselves this way or another way. When India lost the cricket game a few years back to Sri Lanka, you know, people went out and killed themselves. Well, the concept, of course, that you're coming back again, it means then if this life is not comfortable, you don't like it, it's uncomfortable, then you can always do away with it and come back again. Now, it's also related to the idea why Hindus uh, are vegetarians or, or hold the idea of vegetarianism, though it is not originally a part of Hindu teachings. Because, on one hand, if the person is good and he goes up on the ladder, up in the human caste, up to the Brahman, if he is bad, he goes down. And he could reappear then as a goat, you know, or a pig or whatever else. So, it's not good to go eat animal because maybe you're eating your grandfather or, you know, something like this. So this this thing of vegetarianism became infused in the society. I mean, philosophically, of course, people may be trying to promote it today as being healthy, you know, it is better, human beings really weren't meant to eat animals, etc., etc. But the essence of what is behind it is their belief that human beings can come back as the same animals that we're eating. This is the essence of it. And for Muslims, of course, this is rejected. The idea of coming back is rejected. And God made human beings with an ability to uh, utilize animal uh, flesh to, to digest it. Gave teeth that could break it down and enzymes that could break it down in the stomach and the body which could absorb it. So if it wasn't really for us to eat, then why were we created in this way? At any rate, as we said, this belief in Hinduism that God, human beings were created from God, and God becomes a human being, or became a human being, became, became in animal forms, etc. And after that time, you have other individuals referred to all for as avatars, you know, God being present in human beings, the most famous of whom is uh, Sai Baba, right? Sai Baba in India, who is worshipped by millions, including some of the leading figures in India, they worship this individual, Sai Baba, as God. This is a belief held by the Hindu world. If we look in the Christian world, we find a similar belief. In the case of Hindus, they held that God manifested himself at least 10 major times and a number of minor times after that. And in the case of Christians, they promoted the idea that God manifested himself one time as Jesus. However, if we were to look at that Christian belief that Jesus was God. God's Son and at the same time God. We can find that that belief doesn't have support in the early development of Christianity. It is something which came about some time after Jesus, particularly promoted by Paul. He is the main architect of this belief. It is put in the Gospels, 
specifically in the Gospel of John, where it is stated, in the beginning of it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It goes on to say, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. However, even in the Gospel of John, according to John, these statements are not made by Jesus. These are statements made by the writer of the Gospel. And Christian scholars are unanimous that this Gospel was not written by John, the disciple of Jesus. This was written by somebody who was anonymous. When you actually go back to the early beliefs of Christianity, these beliefs become evident if we research a particular individual. This individual is referred to in early Christian writings as James, the brother of Jesus. In recent times, a number of leading biblical scholars have begun to do serious research into this individual known as James. There are three books, three major works available on the market today, which are worth looking into for those who come from Christian backgrounds. One is called Just James, The Death of a Legend by John Painter. Another is called James, the Brother of Jesus by Robert Eisman. And the third is called James, Brother of Jesus by Pierre Antoine uh, Bernheim. These are major works. All of them are well over 400 pages of research, academic research into James. They all confirm from the early records that James was the head of the Jerusalem church. He was the first bishop, so to speak. In fact, the author, Robert Eisman, points out that if we were to look at the material which described Jesus and which described James with regards to early writings, there is far more material about James than there is about Jesus. And further research confirms that James headed that church in Jerusalem for the first two decades after the time of Jesus. And these followers, referred to commonly as Jewish Christians, adhere to a set of beliefs which are significantly different from Christian beliefs today. The Jewish Christians, Pierre and Paul writes, are those Jews by birth or conversion who observe all or the greatest part of the precepts of the Mosaic law while believing that Jesus was the Messiah, a prophet like Moses, or another exalted figure. And he goes on to point out that were those early Christians Jewish Christians would be told in fact that they were not Jews, they would have been very surprised. Because in terms of the practice, their practice is in fact Jews still continue to follow the law of Moses, they wash themselves with no prayer, or they, they went through the same, continue the same rituals and rituals. And they came to be known as the Edenites, the term which one can research and find out what it says on them. Edenites actually meant four men. 
And this was a term which did not have any use in the dominating of the early Christians were called. They took this title uh, based on the statement attributed to Jesus in which he was most of the blessed of the poor. And James headed this Jerusalem church. And the Jerusalem church was the dominant church. Paul came into conflict with the ideas that he was promoting. He came into conflict with them. In fact, one of the early church historians, Irenaeus, he wrote that the Ebionites believed in one God, the Creator, taught that Jesus was the Messiah, used only the Gospel according to Matthew, and rejected Paul as an apostate from the Jewish law. This is early Christian historian writing. So this is telling us that the idea that God became man was obviously not from the teachings of Jesus, and it was not that which was held by the early Christians, referred to as the Jewish Christians or the Judeo-Christians. This came with the teachings promoted by Paul. Paul, who absorb Greek logic and arguments to promote the idea that Jesus was God. He used the term Logos to refer to, to Jesus and this term is also found in that Gospel of John and it is well known that this term is an ancient Greek philosophical concept which evolved in its understanding till the early, the beginnings of, of the time after Jesus, in which Philo, the Jewish philosopher of Alexandria, proposed the last basic statement concerning the Logos, that it was the intermediary between God and the cosmos, being the agent of creation and the agent in the agent through which Human, the human mind can comprehend God. And he actually made the statement in his writings that the Logos was the first begotten son of God. This idea was already expressed before it became a part of the later Gospels and the writings of later Christians. So, from that, we can conclude that the concept of God being a man or becoming a man was alien to Jesus' teachings and to those of the early Christians. However, it became a part as a result of the efforts of Paul and others as Christianity and the teachings went through Greece and into Rome. Those teachings became paganized to greater and greater degrees. The day of worship was shifted from the Sabbath to Sunday, the day for the worship of the sun god Apollo in Rome, and so on and so forth. Christianity and its beliefs shifted into the concept, this pagan concept, that God became a man. Now, this concept has also crept into Muslim belief in some segments of Muslim society. Where the philosophical concept that the human soul is divine was accepted in certain circles, which came to be known as the mystic circles, the circles of mysticism, or Sufism is another name which is used. This idea that God, when he created Adam, he literally breathed a part of himself into Adam, that the human soul was in fact a part of the divine soul, a part of God. This idea, when it spread, it became the basis of the concept that human beings could become God. 
as God and become a part of human beings, that human beings could become God. It's not exactly the same as what developed in Hinduism and Christianity, but it it's a counterpart, it's similar to, it has links with the true Islamic concept in regards to the human soul is that the human soul is created. It is not a part of God. Yes, Allah did use the terms that when He created God, He said, But this term that I blew into Adam from my soul, this term has to be looked at within the context of the whole Quran. All of the different references where God refers to a thing as being His. And we find God referring to the angel Gabriel as being Ruhuna, our spirit. But we don't understand it to be God. So God uses this term as being his spirit or a part of his spirit, not meaning literally that it is a piece and a portion of God, but that this spirit was a noble spirit. It is given a special status as God refers to his house, Betullah, or God may refer to his camel, Naqatullah, in the case of the camel which was sent to Prophet Salih as a miracle. So, the correct Islamic understanding is that the human soul is not divine. God does not possess a soul. God created the soul by his command. When Prophet ﷺ was asked about the soul, he was told to say, what? Qul amri rabbi. Say that the ruh, the soul, is from my God's, my Lord's command. And Allah says throughout the Quran that whenever He wishes something to be, 